Hello everyone, it's me, Aaron, Professor Thorgy, and welcome back to our look back at the top 100 comics of 2020. Now, if you missed part one, you can click on the card that's popping up right now. In that video, you will see our rules about what went into the making of this list, but you will also get the countdown of numbers 100 through 51. But if you're all caught up, then join me as we continue the list with number 50, Venom. This year, we saw what Donny Cates had been leaning up to with everyone's favorite brain eater as we got the start of the King in Black event. But I'll be honest with you, what really gets this book on this list is how it began this year. At the start of 2020, we saw the Venom Island storyline playing out in which Eddie Brock was stranded on an island where he had to confront the darkest parts of his past and himself, all while being hunted down predator style by the Carnage symbiote, forcing him to really rely more on himself than on his alien partner. This ended up becoming one of my favorite Venom storylines, and this book keeps surprising me to this day with how good it is. Number 49, Star Wars Darth Vader. This year, Marvel Star Wars books end up moving into their next phase as they now were set right after Empire Strikes Back, but before the events of Return of the Jedi, and Greg Pak ended up taking over the Darth Vader series, so we got to see what was going through Vader's mind right after he offered Luke Skywalker the chance to join him, after he revealed to him that he was his father, but now that he's been rejected, Darth Vader has a lot going through his head. He wants to research what happened to Luke. He wants to hunt down where exactly Luke could have strayed from the same path that Darth Vader was on. So that means retracing his steps. That means going back to where Luke Skywalker grew up and it means exploring what exactly happened to Luke in his past, but more importantly, what happened to Vader in his past? And well, there's a rather big twist that ends up happening at the end of issue one of this book, and I don't want to spoil it, but as soon as I saw that, and as soon as I started to see how it played out in issue number two, I was stunned that no one had done this yet with a Darth Vader book. It feels like the perfect premise for a Darth Vader book, and it had just been sitting right there. No one had ever touched it, and Greg Pak, pick that up, and he is handling that with expert level craftsmanship. He is handling that in a way that lets you fully understand where Darth Vader is as a character, how his history is constantly playing out in his mind, and it does quite possibly the best job of linking the prequel trilogy to the original trilogy. Speaking entirely honestly, I started to fall off of the Marvel Star Wars books after they moved into their second phase, but this book has now gotten me back and fully invested in them. Number 48, Join the Future. This book is one of the most inventive and brilliant westerns I've read in a long time. The concept is that in the future, there's a big amazing city where everyone has jobs, everyone has perfect health, luxurious homes, they have everything they could want. However, there are some people that refuse to sell their land and move into the city. And the city isn't taking no for an answer. So a young girl sees her family destroyed before her eyes. So now she has to set out with her six shooter to get revenge for her pa, which is a very classic Western tale, except in this story, she has a rusty old Smith & Weston and the people she's going after have drones and laser beams. It's a great story of past me in the future, of feeling like the little guy who can't stand up to the inevitable, and the main character of Clem is one of my favorite new characters this year. Number 47, Shang-Chi. Here's something that you probably don't know about me. Shang-Chi is one of my favorite underrated characters. One of those characters who I keep hoping will get a brand new ongoing, one of those characters who I hope will appear in something big with a major role, so I always kind of root him on, and this year we got a brand new miniseries starring him, being written by Jean Lun Yang, and oh my goodness, this is giving me the Shang-Chi book that I have been wanting for years. Jin Lun Yang is easily one of the best writers out there working right now, and every time that he gets a brand new book, it always brings a big smile to my face because it means that he's getting a little bit more exposure, and a few more people are starting to discover him. I'm hoping that this book introduces a whole new audience, not just to Jin Lun Yang, but also the character of Shang-Chi himself, because Jin Lun Yang is nailing this depiction of this character. He gives so much humanity to Shang-Chi. He makes him feel like such a real character while at the same time still embracing this almost magical world of martial arts that exist within the Marvel Universe. Number 46, Hellions. How in God's name 
did Hellions, the book starring characters like Wild Child and Orphan Maker, ended up becoming arguably the best X-Men book out there. Every single X-Men book right now is good. There is not a single X-Men book that I would consider to be bad or even just okay. I think that they're all good or great or amazing at this point. And yet Hellions, the book that when it was announced, I looked at and said, what, have we just run out of characters now to talk about? Ended up becoming what is easily my favorite among them. This book asks the question, okay, we know that all the mutants are now living together and all the mutants have put their past behind them. So even the big crazy genocidal madmen like Apocalypse or Magneto, they're all living in peace with all the other mutants and they've agreed not to hurt humans. Yeah, what about the ones who are just insane? What about the ones who you can't cage them? You can't tell them to put their claws away. They're the ones who are just going to start trouble. What do you do with them? Well, you hand them over to Mr. Sinister and he creates his own Thunderbolts, his own suicide squad with them, which considering the fact that with the current setup of the X-Men, they can now just keep getting revived over and over again, even if they die, it makes the concept of a suicide squad a very interesting thing for the X-Men. But this book, the thing that makes it so good, the thing that makes it such an amazing read is as I mentioned in our last episode, people keep sleeping on Zeb Wells. People keep forgetting what amazing writer Zeb Wells is. This guy is one of the most talented and witty and clever writers out there. And he is taking what other people have done with Mr. Sinister over the years, and he has stretched that to amazing new territory, making him quite possibly my favorite character to read in books today. Almost every line of dialogue out of Mr. Sinister's mouth in this book is just a delight. It just perks me up and puts a big old smile on my face. But it's not like the book is just pure comedy. No, what's happening with Havoc, what's happening with the other characters, what's going through their minds, he gives so much depth to so many characters, many of whom, as I said a moment ago, I didn't really care about before reading this book. This book, if you have still not picked it up, simply because you, like me, saw the premise and saw the team and you thought, I have no interest in that, I'm telling you, reconsider that. This book is so much better than any of us thought it was going to be. Number 45, Skull Digger and Skeleton Boy. Jeff Lemire continues to expand the Black Hammer world that he created many years ago. And every single time they creates a new character for it, he makes this world richer and he makes it feel more like a fully established superhero world. It honestly reminds me of what people always kind of applauded Astro City for being. And this year, we got a brand new character with Skull Digger and Skeleton Boy. And the best way that I can describe this book is imagine if when Bruce Wayne's parents were murdered right before him, he didn't go home and sulk and then saw a bat and decide, yes, I'm going to become the Batman and I'm going to go out there and fight for vengeance. No, imagine if right after his parents were killed, the Punisher then showed up, murdered the criminal that killed his parents right in front of him, and then walked away, and now Bruce Wayne can't stop thinking about the Punisher. And then the Punisher eventually adopts him to become his Robin. In fact, in all honesty, I think that's probably the better way to describe this. Imagine if it's just that Dick Grayson was not adopted by Batman, he was adopted by the Punisher. That really is the best way to sum this up. And this book does a great job of depicting not only how disturbing of a concept that is, but of how low someone has to get of how desperate someone has to get to look up to someone like the Punisher, or in this world, Skull Digger, and go, yeah, that guy, I want to be him. I want to embrace what that guy is. It really does try to get into the mindset of how screwed up someone has to become, of what terrible things has to happen to someone to get them to that point. But it also stops to make sure to explore how dangerous this is. What a bad idea it is for someone like the Punisher to try and raise a kid's sidekick. Number 44, Kanto to the Hollow Men. If you watched our list last year, you know that Kanto was one of the biggest surprises of the year. It was this incredibly charming and very imaginative dark fantasy story about this little tiny Tinker Tailor Knight, this little mechanical knight who's going off on a quest 
to try and save all the other members of his race who have been enslaved, but now their hearts are starting to stop, so he has to go and try and find a way to save them all. And this story picks up after the events of that book, in which they discover, yeah, uh, they're not out of the woods just yet. Their hearts are starting to stop, so they have to go out there and try and find a way to save themselves. And this story, in many ways, it is similar to Canto 1, is a story about this knight going out on a quest into this big, strange land. In fact, many of the elements that were set up in the previous book are now playing out in this book. Now he has several other knights join him, so while at the same time it is embracing the stuff that I enjoyed about the first series, it is still adding many new elements to it. Number 43, Magnificent Miss Marvel. I think that it is safe to say that Saladin Ahmed is doing the best job right now of any writer out there, especially of any writer at Marvel, when it comes to writing families. When it comes to writing the families that surround the superheroes that we're following, because this year, not only did he continue to do a great job over on the Miles Morales book, but over in The Magnificent Miss Marvel, he really did lean even further into Kamala's relationship with her parents and with her family. And for a large part of this year, that was the big appeal of this book. But then we went into the Outlawed event, and I mentioned this yesterday, I might not be the biggest fan of the premise of the Outlawed event because it's far too similar to just being, you know, Civil War III as I described it. But the way that writers are tackling the Outlawed event in their individual books is marvelous. No pun intended. No, seriously, I did not mean to do that. I just realized I did it right now. And for anybody who doesn't know, the Outlawed event, it's all centered around how there was a supervillain attack, the teenage superheroes behind the champions all showed up to try and stop it, but a young girl ended up getting hurt during this attack, and that young girl was Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel herself. So now the United States government is passing a law that no one under the age of 21 can be a superhero, and Kamala is the face behind that, even though she is the biggest teenage superhero out there. This is a great, very complex situation to find this character in and provide so much drama that you can write behind how she must be feeling, all the different elements that must be going through her mind, how her friends are feeling about this, and Saladin Ahmed is able to capture all of that. It is truly a shame that Saladin Ahmed's run on this book is coming to an end soon, simply because in these final past couple of issues, with what's been going on in Outlawed, he has provided so much depth to this character, and he has given her so much complexity. There is always depth and complexity in Miss Marvel, don't get me wrong, but Saladin Ahmed is handling this particular struggle that she is going through excellently, and I also love how he is able to take the current Outlawed event and also make it a very clear metaphor for things that are going on in our own world, making members of Cradle to be very clear metaphors for agents of ICE or other government operatives. And I love that he is making this into a much larger and more important story than it seemed on paper. Number 42, Ascender. I think I said this exact thing last year, but it does bear repeating that when the Descender book, which was a series all about space exploration and heavy sci-fi concepts and robots, announced that they were just going to get rid of all of that as all technology was going to be wiped out, and in this universe, magic was now going to spring up, and they were going to continue this story many years past all of those events in a book called Ascender about these same characters many years later on, now exploring this universe that was now flourishing with magic, I did not know how to take that. I mean, that was a pretty bold decision to come in here and just go, yeah, we're going to completely wipe out everything that this book has been about to be about the exact opposite of that. So I do have to give them points just for how bold that is, but even just beyond that, even just beyond how gutsy of a decision that is, I gotta give it up for the fact that this book is actually managing to pull that off. And this year we got to explore this magical element even more, but more importantly, we got to see everything that was setting up. This is a Jeff Lemire book, and Jeff Lemire is great at setting up elements and watching them all play out. And this year, we got to see even more of the upcoming storylines begin to stack up. We got to watch as our new protagonist started to develop more, and we got to see the relationships between her and some of the characters from the previous book start to establish and grow even more. In other words, this year in Ascender, it started to remind me of all those things that I loved about Descender. 
Number 41, Colonel Weird Cosmogog. Another one of the Black Hammer storyline spinoffs from Jeff Lemire. This book is focusing on the mind and on the journey of Colonel Weird, who, okay, I was about to say is a very weird character, but that goes without saying when you look at his name. He was one of the more interesting characters from the Black Hammer series because he was a character who just kept popping up here and there, and you could tell that he always knew things that the other characters didn't because while everyone else saw the world in three-dimensional terms, he was probably on, I don't know, the eighth or ninth dimension. Yeah, he was seen through time and space, and he was seeing his own history and their history and their futures. He could witness everything at once. So writing the adventure of a character like that and trying to do a deep dive on his history and really trying to explore everything from his past that made him the person that he is, that is a massive undertaking, even for the person who invented this character. But Jeff Lemire, once again, is showing that he understands how to do big, crazy, far out, trippy ideas. He understands how to get deep and emotional with characters, and he understands how to do both those things at once. Number 47 Secrets. I talk a lot about how Tom Taylor has the magical ability to grasp the heart and what we love about established characters from Marvel and DC, but what is he able to accomplish with his own original properties? Answer, pretty much the same thing. Seven Secrets is about an ancient order of super agents who protect seven secrets that could change the fate of the world, and this story focuses on one small boy who is the child of two of their top agents. However, because their agents aren't allowed to have children, he is essentially raised by the entire organization, and the bizarre family dynamic that is established in here is so rich, and the world is so well thought out with a deep lore that you really get invested in, and our protagonist Casper is insanely likable. He is a breakout star this year, and all these things work together to make this a book that with every single issue just made me want to read the next one. Number 39, X-Men Fantastic Four. X4. X4 is a notable miniseries because it accomplished two things. One is that because it focused on Franklin Richards, it depicted what it felt like to be at that time in your life where you feel like no one understands you. And by having two different authority figures argue over your future without really ever asking how you feel about it, it was able to get the reader into that mindset. But on a larger scale, when it comes to the Marvel Universe at least, it was also able to address relationships between humans and mutants with the X-Men's new standing in the world, and it felt like we really needed to finally have a book address that. It kind of felt refreshing to have four issues of someone turning to the X-Men and saying, you guys know you're acting like a-holes, right? The moment when Sue Richards turns to Scott Summers and directly asks him, so you think my daughter isn't equal to my son? You think that she's inferior to him because of how she was born? And he just shuts up because he doesn't know how to respond to that was great. And it was a conversation people have needed to have in these comics for a little while now. Number 38, Wonder Woman, Dead Earth. I didn't know what to expect from this book when it was first announced, a dark gritty post-apocalyptic storyline starring Wonder Woman of all characters, and it was now going to be under DC's new Black Label line that embraced more mature and graphic stories. Felt like it could go very wrong very fast. However, this story ended up being a strong emotional journey for Diana as she finds herself in a terrifying world that she had always tried to prevent, and the more she learns about how she got here, the more hopeless things feel. But as I've pointed out many times with several titles on this list, sometimes during the most hopeless stories, you can find gold. You can find raw emotional nerves that hit you hard with each page, and that's what Daniel Warren Johnson was able to create in this title. I will admit there is one part where I felt like the book just kind of lost the tone completely and sort of jumped the shark, but aside from that, this book is full of bright, shining moments that stuck with me all year long. Number 37, Firepower. This book is just flat out cool. This is a modern day interpretation of the classic martial arts trope about there being some sacred village off in the mountains and if you go up there then you can learn a secret training technique. It's basically exactly what Iron Fist was based around, it's what so many other movies and legendary stories have all been built around, but we haven't really gotten a new fresh take on that in a while, and the new fresh take that we got on it is that it's just being done really well. There isn't really a lot original behind this book, however, Robert Kirkman gives that humanity that he is famous for creating in series such as Invincible into this series, while also creating some of the most likable new characters that I have read all year long, 
and he sets up a much bigger world that I really want to explore. And again, I compared this to Robert Kirkman's other works with Invincible. I feel like for a long time now, Robert Kirkman has been trying to create a book that captures that same tone as his original Invincible series, and none of them have really hit the mark. This one hits the mark. This is my first time since reading those early Invincible books that I thought, oh, this could go somewhere, and I definitely want to follow it. Number 36, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Talk about a turnaround. If you have watched us for a long time now, then you know I have been a big champion of this book. But if you've only watched us for a short while, you probably don't know that because the early issues of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from IDW have been one of my biggest surprises in comics. It has been one of the most delightful, engaging, and exciting series I have read from any publisher out there However, over the past year or so, the book's kind of fallen off my radar. I've lost interest in the title. None of the stuff they've attempted to do in the series has really been able to pull me back in or engage me again in the way that those early titles did. However, at the end of 2019, they made a rather large change in this book in which the mutagenic ooze that ended up mutating the turtles gets unleashed on a section of New York and the entire population of this small neighborhood ends up getting mutated, and now that neighborhood has been walled off, and now the turtles are no longer dark vigilantes living in the shadows trying to keep themselves secret from the rest of the population. Now they're just normal citizens, and they're walking around in a town low with other mutants, and now there's brand new relationships that they can form with people, and now there's a whole new dynamic to how everything works in this neighborhood, and now they're no longer trying to keep themselves separate from people, they're actually setting up like their own dojo, and they're trying to train people so they can defend themselves in this neighborhood, and they're actually doing normal things like going out to clubs at night so that they can hang out with other people. It is a bold, fresh new take on the turtles and I kind of love it. It's providing this book with that energy that I have been missing from it from so long and for the first time in a long time I've got that same excitement that I had when I first started reading this title. Number 35, Philadelphia. Philadelphia is one of the most beautiful horror comics I've read in my life. While at the same time, being one of the craziest concepts for a book I've ever seen. The story is about a father and son whose relationship has fallen cold, and while they investigate this case together, they slowly have to address their past. What is this case? Vampires rising up and running rampant across Philadelphia. The story not only does an incredible job depicting the complex relationship between these two partners, it also sets up many different elements to the vampire story that could fuel this series for years to come. And as I said, there is one particular surprise about who is behind the vampire plot that, well, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but I still can't believe they decided to go with such a crazy idea, and yet somehow they made it work. Somehow after reading this, I look back at a thing that I thought was insane and might end up ruining the book, and now I can't picture this book working without that insane crazy idea. And speaking of horror comics with weird crazy ideas behind it, at number 34, DC's Dead Planet. Yes, the third of the DC's books that were released last year. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to chuckle at that. It's just still insane to me that we got three of these things last year. This book had a much larger task set ahead of it than any of the other DC's books, because while those books were set during the same time period as that original series, this one was set many years afterwards, so we now had to follow the adventures of all the surviving characters as they must now return to Earth, and it does what I love seeing zombie stories do. They ask what comes next. They ask, okay, we all survived the zombie apocalypse, we all got away, we all survived, but now we have to go back and we have to see what has become of this world. And the thing that I love is that this entire series, it isn't just going back and oh, look at all the zombies. No, it addresses some of the bigger threats that are left on the planet. Some of the non-zombie threats, such as, you know, man, which I will admit when it comes to zombie stories, I've kind of grown cold to the idea of man is the real enemy because we've seen it time and time and time again. And yet Tom Taylor was able to take that concept and build it into something much larger. He was able to have it be a message about much bigger issues than just the individual characters that were within this book. 
And again, this is still being written by Tom Taylor, which means that, of course, there's going to be tons of heart. There's going to be amazing character moments. There's going to be fantastic dialogue. I don't even feel like I need to say that stuff anymore. I feel like I can just say it's a book written by Tom Taylor, and that goes without saying at this point. Number 33, The Impending Blindness of Billy Scott. This is a story about a young artist who has kept herself mostly isolated from everyone else around her so that way she can focus on her art. And after all this time and after all this focus, all of it is starting to pay off as she finally gets an opportunity for her work to be displayed in a gallery. However, right after receiving this news and realizing that she really needs to sit down and focus on getting some of her best work together so it can be shown off at this gallery, she gets some rather bad news, and if you can see the title of this book, you can probably guess what that bad news is. Yes, she finds out that within two weeks, she is going to go completely blind, so she decides to finally throw off all of her hesitations, throw off everything that has been holding her back this entire time, and she sets out to go on a journey across London, so that way she can find 10 people who she can paint for this showcase. Just the description that I gave alone should let you know how much is writing in this book, how much our protagonist is going to struggle, how high the stakes are, and you can definitely tell this is going to be a book that hits many giant emotional chords. If you are an artist in any way, shape, or form, I feel like this is a book that you absolutely need to read, because when you get to the end of the series, you see that it's basically just one giant message about the beauty of creating art and about how it's important to just go out there and do that. And I will take this moment just real quickly to say I know for a fact that this is a book that is going to hit a certain audience really hard because I didn't see this book on anybody's best of the year list, not because it's not a good book, but just because I don't think a lot of people even know about this book. And as I was looking for recommendations for best of the year, as I said, I didn't see it on any of the big professional critics pages, but a lot of people who follow our channel started sending me recommendations for this. Multiple people sent me this recommendation. I had never even heard of this. I didn't find it on Comixology. I didn't find it at any major comic book store. I had to hunt this thing down and get it special ordered, but that just goes to show how important this book is to the people out there who it's going to speak to. Number 32, Wasted Space. Wasted Space is one of those books that I only read when it's time for me to do my big binge of all the books from the previous year for this list, and every single year it continues to shock me with how good it is. This book about a ragtag group of outcasts making their way across space on a holy mission has some of the greatest character exploration of any book out there, and that was the main focus of a giant chunk of the issues that came out this year. There's about three issues back to back where it is just these characters who had been through so much just breaking down where they are mentally and if you love to just suit up in your emotional diving gear and sink into an ocean of mental reflection this book was stellar for that this year seriously i've recommended this series for like three years in a row now if you haven't checked it out yet i can firmly say it keeps getting better with each issue jump on this title number 31 aquaman this year, Kelly Sue DeConnick brought her run on Aquaman to an end, and I think it is safe to say that this is going to go down as one of the best Aquaman runs any author has ever had on that title. She did an amazing job of exploring every single one of the characters within this title, and this was the year in which we really got to see Arthur end up becoming a father, and I will admit, I flat out love Father Aquaman. I loved seeing the way that he now treated his child, the way that he treated his wife. I mean, Aquaman and Mira are supposed to have one of the most loving relationships in comics, and Kelly Sue DeConnick absolutely nailed that connection that the two of them had, especially when you got to see moments in here, such as Aquaman going to visit her when she was in a coma, and him trying to keep his spirits high while you could tell they had so much weighing on him and then she was able to take this very personal human relationship that all these characters have with each other i mean you could take all the atlantis stuff out of here you could take out all of the magical fish powers out of this entire thing and this would just be a really engaging story about a married couple and their new child and all the people around them but then when you throw in the magical elements when you throw in all the political relationships and things that are going on in atlantis it takes this story to really those peaks then aquaman story should be able to reach number 30 
Gideon Falls. For years now, Gideon Falls has been one of the best horror series out there as Jeff Lemire has crafted a compelling story about the mystery of the town known as Gideon Falls, a mystery revolving around an ominous black barn and a shadowy smiling man. And this story has twisted back and forth, not just between different protagonists, but different dimensions and times. And this year, that story came to an end, and it feels like all the ideas this creative team had been holding onto just exploded onto the page as we went to the center of creation and finally got the big standoff between our heroes and one of the most sinister villains I've ever read in comics. Number 29, One Story. This is one of the heaviest books that I have read all year because it is a story about an aging man who is in a mental institution as his mind is leaving him and he's just getting glimpses of things from his past. He is trying to put his thoughts together, but at the same time, the story is also cutting back to the tale of one of his ancestors during World War I during a pinnacle fight in which he was afraid that he would not survive it. And you keep seeing these two stories coming back and forth, and you're not entirely sure at first how the two of them end up connecting, but that's kind of what makes the connection between the two of them brilliant, because you're slowly starting to interpret this as you read this story, and you're starting to see all the different ins and outs of how they connect with each other. And honestly, either one of these stories on their own would definitely have been an engaging tale because you've got this aging man and you feel so heartbroken for him, but then it will constantly keep cutting back to the relationship that he had with his family and you start to see how the, his children view him and you start to realize, oh, this guy, he wasn't exactly a wonderful figure in their lives and they have a very complex history with him so you really want to know more about what went down between the two of them. But then as you learn more of that, you see how this relates back to that story about his ancestor. But you don't know how that story with his ancestor is going to end. And honestly, there's just so many different twisting and interconnecting layers in this story. And it makes it one of the most intriguing reads of the year, but also makes it one of the most emotional reads of the year because you're just constantly getting hit from two different angles as you go through this book. And speaking of gorgeously drawn books that are all about complex parent-child relationships and moving back and forth between the present and the past, and number 28, Blue and Green. Blue and Green is the story about a jazz musician who goes back home after his mother dies and has to help clean everything out but as he is going through all of her possessions, he can't but help reflect on the complex past that the two of them had and about how many times she was constantly trying to put him down, how many times she was trying to tell him not to pursue anything that he loved, how many times that she was just being abusive to him. But while he is reflecting upon this, he ends up finding something within her possessions that raises many questions. He finds a picture of someone he has never seen before and it's another musician, and he wants to know the connection that he had with his mother. And he starts trying to hunt down clues, but as he hunts these clues down, he can almost feel sort of like a muse rising up in him. He can feel his musical talent stirring back up, and suddenly he finds himself being able to play like he's never been able to play before. And the way that I describe this, many of you might be picturing in your mind right now, some sort of a story about someone reconnecting with their past or discovering what it is that's really important to them. Nope, this is a horror story. This is a horror story that really comes down to a sort of deal with the devil kind of situation. But at the same time, it doesn't ignore all those things that I set up. It doesn't ignore this concept of going back and trying to discover things from your past or understanding maybe where your parents were coming from when you think back on some of the darker times between the two of you. The story accomplishes an awful lot and really the only reason why it's not higher on my list is because I do kind of wish that the book was longer. It feels like the book sort of just comes to a bit of an abrupt end. It doesn't just like, you know, found footage just cut off and that's it. No, no, there is an ending in here, but I really wish that we had gone on for 10, 20, 30 more pages. I feel like there was still so much story left to tell in here, and I definitely wanted to see where they could have kept going with this. Also, one final compliment that I have to give this book is that this is probably the most artfully written book of the year. 
You could take out all the drawings and all the paintings and all the inkings, which you absolutely should not do because the artwork in the book itself is stunning. Some of the best art in any tile this year, but you could just read what Ram V put on the page. The way that Ram V is able to describe every single action and every single panel in this story, it makes you feel like you're using all of your senses as you read this book. Like you're just being transported right there into that moment, not just physically, but emotionally as well. Number 27, Suicide Squad. I think this might be the last book from Tom Taylor on this list, and I'm kind of happy to see that simply because I don't know how many more times I can just applaud all the amazing things that Tom Taylor is able to do. Listen, if you have listened to me recommend so many of the DC's books and the Injustice books and Seven Secrets this year alone, and you still don't know what this writer is able to do with these characters, I don't know what else I can tell you, but in Suicide Squad, he's still able to do all the stuff that makes him a great writer. He is able to take this group of outcasts, this group of characters that really don't fit in anywhere. I mean, the Suicide Squad is kind of fine on being characters who are on the outs, but they oftentimes find connections between the two of them when they're in really dark, desperate situations and he is able to just capture all of that beautifully in here. He is able to come in here and not only create tons of fresh new original characters, each of which are really interesting and could absolutely carry many titles on their own, but he is able to take the established characters such as Deadshot and give them some of the best moments of any character this year. All the stuff in here about Deadshot and his daughter, that was fantastic. Those were great moments and they absolutely speak to the heart of that character, which as I have said time and time again, that's just what Tom Taylor can do. He can just pinpoint that exact thing that we all like about these characters, or even if it's something that we didn't like about these characters, he can kind of look at a character and go, this is the thing that you should like about this character. I'm sure there's tons of people out there who really like Deadshot. They don't care at all about the relationship between him and his daughter. After you read this book, that is going to be the number one thing that you care about when you think of Deadshot. But beyond all that, the wacky, wild, dark sense of humor that's in this book, the way that tension just rises up, the way that they build the villain up throughout the course of this year, there's so many things in this title that just flat out work. And again, it's Tom Taylor. I don't know what else I can say at this point. It's just a masterful course made up of really dynamic characters being prepared for you by a chef who that's their specialty. That is the thing that they know how to do. And our final book for today's portion of the list at number 26, The Flash. This year, Joshua Williamson wrapped up his run on Barry Allen, and is there any doubt in anyone's mind that he is going to go down as the best writer to ever tackle Barry Allen? I mean, the guy was dead for about 30 years, so it's not exactly like there is a very high bar that anyone has to pass, but even still, I don't know when we're ever going to get a writer on this book that will surpass him on this title. And he ended his run in 2020 with the finish line storyline that not only saw a giant climactic battle between Barry Allen and his longtime enemy Eobar Thawne, but it also did such a marvelous job of reestablishing the Flash family. It did such an incredible job of reminding all readers that this is the thing that is special about The Flash, and that's really been one of the things at the core of Joshua Williamson's run on this title. He understood The Flash family, and he spent all this time really trying to come in here and make that something that everyone would know. Make that something that no matter who you are, no matter what your history is with The Flash, if you have read this tale, you are going to walk away understanding why that is an important side of this character. Also, if I can be completely honest with you guys, it doesn't hurt that he stopped and just flat out turned to the camera at one point and said, okay, here's some big problems that have happened recently with certain characters over at DC. I'm going to address them flat out right here in this one page. That was kind of nice. I appreciate that. 
And that is it for today. Part two of our look back at the top 100 comics from 2020 is now done. That's number 26 through 50. If you missed number 51 through 100, that'll be popping up in a card in just a moment. And if you want to see the next part, which is going to be numbers 11 through 25, then make sure that you click that subscribe button and come back next time. You can always find out when these episodes go live by following us around the web on Twitter at Professor Thory, and you can also find me on Twitch, also at Professor Thory. Thanks for tuning in. Let me know what you thought about these books in the comments down below. Come back next time.